Hello, and welcome to your most obedient and humble servant. This is a women's history podcast where we feature 18th and early 19th century women's letters that don't get as much attention as we think they should. I'm your host, Catherine Garrett. This episode is part of our season on wit. And today I am so excited to welcome Dr. Alexandra Garrett. She is the assistant professor of history at St. Michael's College. Dr. Garrett's research deals with elite white women of the 18th and 19th century, specifically with slaveholding white women. Uh, So it's extremely pertinent to this podcast. Uh, We've actually worked together in the past. Alexandra did a piece on Martha Washington. Yeah, no, I did um, a piece for Mount Vernon magazine. I was a fellow there for three months in 2019-2020, and it was titled How Widowhood Changed Martha Washington's Life. It's a short and sweet piece just trying to explain how she got married twice, right? Experienced marriage twice, experienced widowhood twice, and then how her life changed legally, especially during those periods. So from marriage to widowhood to marriage to widowhood. And legally, things would have changed. I remember it was great. So I'm so (laughs) excited to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Of course, you're welcome. I'm so honored to be here. Today, we're doing a Martha Washington letter. She was an elite slaveholding white woman. So how has she come to play in your research? When I was completing my dissertation at the University of Virginia some years ago, I was thinking about how white slave owning women in Virginia, especially the revolutionary and post-revolutionary periods, were managing these dual roles of being a woman in a patriarchal society men have more power than women in a society like that. But at the same time, this is a slave-owning society and slaveholders hold more power over non-slave owners. So what does it mean when you're a woman who has less power, but you're a slaveholder, which means you have more power? So it's supposed to be an intersectional analysis with gender and socioeconomic status, thinking about how they are perceived in this world, how they navigate this world. And then on top of that, thinking about how they navigate marriage. So basically before states enacted what are called Married Women's Property Acts, the first one was in Mississippi, 1839. The final one was actually Virginia, which is the state that we're thinking about today. Uh, The last one was 1877 in Virginia. So before these Married Women Property Acts, different colonies and then also states utilize British common laws versions of kind of legal status for women when it comes to marriage. So if you are married, you'd fell under what's called femme covert, and it looks like F-E-M-E and then covert. That's what it looks like, but it's French, femme covert, which means you have coverture status. It means covered women in French, and this is derived from British common law, and it simply means that you are married. And so in the legal system, your majority, not all, but majority of your property is subsumed under your husband's control because he is the head of household and your legal identity basically is subsumed under his. Not in its entirety. You still have a right to a dower share, which is about one third of what the total combined property would be between your husband and you. But again, that dower share, you own it, but really you more control it. You control it, and then upon your death, it will go to your heirs. If you are a femme sole, that means you are an unmarried woman, meaning you are never married or you're waiting to get married, or you are a widow. So femme sole, right, French, it kind of means uncovered woman, solo woman. It means that you have the same legal rights as a man, With some caveats. So the caveats are you can't vote. That doesn't come until much later. You can't serve on a jury. But you can sign contracts. You can deal with your own business. You can control your own property, control your own wages and your earnings. You can basically legally do everything that a man can do with a couple caveats as long as you are unmarried. So unmarried women are femme souls. Married women are femme covers, but over 90% of women in early America get married. So you got way more femme covers out there than femme souls. However, lots of women also experience widowhood. So if you're going to have a femme soul, you're more likely going to be 
a widow than you are a never married woman? And this is a very long tangent no, to answer your very, very basic question. <laughs> Well, no, Which is to get at Martha Washington. So Martha Washington, <laughs> she was a femme soul, gosh darn it. But she was also a femme Colbert, right? So she was a covered woman and an uncovered woman, meaning she was a single woman. So she fell under femme soul. Then she got married to Daniel Park Custis when she was 18. And therefore, she was a covered woman. She fell under femme Colbert status. He died. She was single again. Not for very long, but she was. So she fell under a different legal status, right? Back to femme soul. And then she got married to dear old Georgie. And they were married for 40 years. And so she was femme Cover again for 40 years. And then he died before her. Ah, so now she's back to <laughs> femme soul. I'm trying to think about what this would have meant in her life. It's one thing to have legal changes. And it's another thing to like, what are you actually experiencing day to day? So anyways, I was interested in that. That's how she factored into my dissertation. I was one of the team of editors who published the papers of Martha Washington, came out in 2022, which is a edition of all of Martha Washington's correspondence. And a lot of the letters that we have from Martha are during of her early life. We don't have any from her youth, but there are quite a few from her first widowhood from mm -hmm. Daniel Park. There's these letters where she's, you know, doing things like signing contracts and, and loaning money and at like extremely high interest. <laughs> Also, I remember when I was doing research on this, in the actual like, language of the Virginia statutes about widowhood, in one of the laws about being like a femme soul, they say, unless you have some sort of disability, and then it lists a husband as a disability. <laughs> <laughs> Which, uh, always made me chuckle, but no one, I, no one thought it was. That makes sense. <laughs> no one thought, oh, no one, no one laughed. They should no one thought it was as funny, funny as I did. <laughs> oh, no, it is funny. Actually, what you're getting at is, is, is actually... <laughs> <laughs> it's it's easy to laugh, but also there's actually some truthiness to it. The idea was, right, you get married and most of your legal identity is subsumed. And so your access to wealth that you would have brought in is, you know, again, not all of it, the majority of it is now, you know, under this husband's control. But some husbands are ne'er-do-wells <laughs> and bums and might be people who get into too much debt. There was this concern for married women, which is why you could think of sometimes like a kind of a, uh, a gambling husband as being a disability to a woman. Actually, what you're bringing up is, is really important because when you think about the Married Women's Property Acts, those were state laws that are enacted over the 19th century. So first one, 1839, last one, 1877. And you might be thinking, well, why that time period? Like, why the mid-1800s? Why the mid-19th century? And by that time period, you have intensifying, increasing capitalism. So you have a lot more boom and bust periods happening in the American economy, meaning more and more people are going into debt or might in their total lifetime experience booms and busts themselves. So the reason then why these acts are carried out state by state, it's actually to protect family interests. It's not because, oh, women are asking for more rights. No, actually what's happening is, hey, before the Married Women's Property Acts, okay, so in Martha Washington's time period, if your husband goes into debt, does a bad business deal, whatever it might be, his creditors will come after him, but he is the head of the whole family. And so the creditors can take personal property from the whole family to pay back that husband's debt. So suddenly, the personal property that a wife has brought into this marriage, this wife's property, is now liable for her husband's debt. So debtors are coming in and taking women's stuff that they brought to the marriage. And that deprives the entire family unit of wealth and property. Now, with these Married Women's Property Acts, Women are protected from that, meaning if my husband goes into debt, makes some bad business decision, gambles, whatever it might be, his creditors come calling, they can only take my husband's stuff. They can't take me, the wife's stuff. And if you can't touch my stuff, yeah, okay, you might be still taking away some husband's property, but the entire family unit, husband and wife, gets away with not being hurt so much. If a wife can keep some of that property, is not liable for her husband's debts anymore, that the family unit is able to hold on to more wealth generally 
than if creditors could come take wife and husband's debts. So really, the Married Women's Property Acts, which were not during Martha's <laughs> lifetime, uh, so when, when you're living during Martha's lifetime, you just hope your husband knows his accounting. But in the mid-19th century, this changes in order to protect whole families from going under. So it's not in response to women's calls for greater autonomy. That's super interesting. And that comes up so much in these letters, particularly a lot of Virginia women at this time period, their husbands are in a huge amount of debt. Not for Martha Washington. George Washington mm -hmm. seems to have been pretty good at keeping those finances in good shape. Um, yeah. Her son, not so much. <laughs> not so much. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that comes up all the time. So it's uh, legal history is so interesting. I'm, I'm so happy to have you on here. And people don't think of how women are affected by legal history, but absolutely they are. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is why the choice of husband during any time before 1839, really, when the first Married Women's Property Act is enacted in, in Mississippi, women getting married was a huge choice for their well-being, and it goes beyond their emotional well-being. It goes to their financial, their entire livelihood. You better choose right. <laughs> and that is a great segue into this letter. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <about yes. laughs> Martha, who is working and trying to get her granddaughter engaged. You got to hand it to Martha Washington. She married well twice. She sure did. To people who had a lot of money and managed it. Now, I mean, again, it depends on what you mean by well. She was a slaveholder marrying other slaveholders. So it's mm -hmm. not like there's also that element. I, I never want a girl boss a slaveholder. But um, Oh, never. No, I'm <laughs> writing my book on a, one of the largest female slave owners in Essex County, Virginia for decades. I tell my students about that and they start their eyes start getting wide with this girl boss energy. And I'm like, mm -mm 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 -mm. No. no, 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 no. Intersectional analysis, my friends. She's powerful because she owns enslaved people. And then their eyes start squinting again and they're like, oh, no. So, yeah, it's a good lesson. It's a good lesson, right? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah, you always have to keep that in mind. I guess we'll move into the actual letter. Yeah. Um, try to keep it to the specific moment. So I'll set up a little bit of the, the background. This is a letter from Martha Washington to her granddaughter, Eleanor, who's called Nellie. Park Custis in what we're pretty sure was January or February of 1796. To get a little bit into the documentary editing weeds, the way that we were able to date this letter was through the, the content of the letter itself. Imagine you're in the 18th century and you're writing a letter to somebody. Normally, you would put down the place and the date that you are writing from. And this was really essential for a number of reasons. Things got lost all the time. Things would be delayed. You didn't know where somebody was. Maybe somebody's saying they're coming to your house and they're letting you know where they're writing from. There's a lot of reasons that you would put when and where you are writing from. But sometimes in some of these more casual women's letters, people either just forgot or didn't really think it was important to do. Martha knows that Nellie knows she's writing from Philadelphia and she's writing this letter quickly. And it's, this is also somebody that she speaks to all the time. So it's a very casual Martha letter. In the past, I've done some Martha Washington letters where she's trying to put her best foot forward. This is not that. This is Martha writing quick stream of consciousness. So she didn't even date it. She didn't date it or say where she was writing from. So from things like her saying that she's going to a ball, mentioning that uh, Nellie's in Alexandria, we were able to look into when Nellie was old enough to be writing and receiving letters, when she was visiting family. And from that, we were able to narrow it down to probably the winter of 1796. At this point, in January, February of 1796, Martha is, they didn't call it the first lady back then, but she's the first lady. Her husband is president. She's 65 years old. In the political world, the Jay Treaty drama is at peak at this point. But Martha's not writing about that. Nellie is almost 17. If you've listened to one of our previous episodes, Episode 7, Strange, Most Passing Strange. We have another letter that was written during this time period, and you can hear more about what Nellie was up to. Suffice it to say that Nellie, her older sister Elizabeth, has just stunned everyone by getting married suddenly without telling anyone. And her sister Patty has just had a daughter. And so Nellie was visiting her sister Patty at this time to visit the new family members. These are the Custis kids who... Uh, Martha Washington sort of adopted two of her grandchildren, George Washington Park Custis and Eleanor Park Custis, and the other two stayed with their mother 
it created this kind of interesting family dynamic where there's like George Washington Park Custis and Nellie are the little prince and princess of America, figuratively speaking. And their siblings, who are just as close to their grandma, are sort of stuck (laughs) and not as sort of famous a situation. So Nellie, when she's writing letters from visiting her family, you can just sort of like feel that she would rather be in Philadelphia. She'd rather be in the thick of it again. She doesn't want to be sort of stuck with all of her dozens of half-siblings and siblings in Virginia. She would rather be uh, back with, with grandma and grandpa. She's going to several balls while she is in Alexandria visiting her sister. And that is the context of this letter Martha is writing, trying to help her get ready for a ball. So uh, with that, take it away. All right. So this is Martha Washington's letter to her Eleanor Park Custis, parentheses, later in life, Lewis. And she's writing from Philadelphia in January or February 1796. And she writes, My dear Nellie, I expect to get your things every moment to put up. A servant of Mr. Eastern's is going to Alexandria. The box will be put under her care for you. I cannot get a pair of white tassels in the city. I think your chemise will look much better with a handkerchief than without. I have sent you one of mine in case you should not have one of your own. I have put up everything that I could think you could want. Ask your cousin to assist in dressing you when you go to the ball. I wish you to look as neat as possible and let all your things be of a piece. My love to you. I wish you may have as much pleasure as you expect. Going to these places, one always expects more pleasure than they realize after the matter is over. Wednesday morning. My dear child, after hurrying Mrs. Wright and getting your things put up and sent to the place they were to go from, the person was not ready to go and the stage is gone without it. I shall have to put it under the care of the stage master and send it tomorrow. I hope you will get it early on Monday. The feathers are the only tolerable ones to be had. They have been picked so often that there are none left that was handsome. Give my love to your sister. The president joins me in love to you and wishing you every happiness. I am, my dear, your ever affectionate, M. Washington. As I told you before, you must not depend altogether on the dress that is going in the stage. Give my love to your cousin. Excellent. A beautiful read. (laughs) Uh, From reading this letter, Alexandra, what are your sort of takeaways? What does that letter make you think about? Sure. It makes me think about a lot of things. First and foremost, our listening audience can't really see the letter, but the pauses, the natural pauses that I took aren't necessarily punctuated in the letter itself. So just to explain punctuation, grammar, spelling, you know, it exists during this time period, but it's not its not uniformly taught to everyone uh, who even happens to have the wealth to receive an education. And for Martha Washington in particular, basically scholars have assumed, we don't have a lot on here, her young life, but scholars have assumed that she might have been taught basic uh, reading and literacy skills from an itinerant tutor growing up. And in Martha Washington's letters, you will notice there's a lot of spelling mistakes or lack of punctuation or words, the same words spelled differently multiple times. I want to be really clear with women of this time period, it's not a sign of intelligence at all. It is instead um, a gender division in education where women were taught to, to write in a way that was more about getting information across. So writing was more of a utilitarian task for women. Whereas for men, they're able to be the ones going to boarding school. If you, if you, first of all, if you really can afford it, they're truly genteel. You're going across the pond for boarding school. But even if not, you know, even if you have an itinerant tutor, you're being taught writing baseline is utilitarian. But on top of that, you want to have this loquacious, flowery, show off yeah. style because you are showing off your education. It's a class status thing to write long sentences with lots of allusions to the books you read about Greek and Roman history. So if anyone reads early American letters from really well-educated men versus, you know, well-educated enough women, you're still going to see these differences. And I just really want to point out it's not about intelligence. It's about what was seen at the time was the point of writing. And the point of writing for women was to keep household counts and to communicate with loved ones. Yeah. Well, and I think that's part of why I thought of this letter 
under the subject of wit. And I just think it's a little bit funny. I don't know if she's trying to be very funny in this, but a little bit. And she does pass on a little bit of wisdom, like going to these places, one always expects more pleasure than they realize after the matter is over. Um, Very good. That was 100% my favorite line. (laughs) Haven't we all experienced that? (laughs) Whether you're a a girl or a boy, right? A teenager, young man or young woman, you get all hyped up to go to the party, right? Because like, you know, there's going to be some single crushes there. Right. And then like you go and like maybe you have a fun time. Maybe you have a devastating time because so-and-so is dancing to so-and-so. But (laughs) when you come home, you're like, wait, I got super hyped up for that. And it was just fine. You know, we have experienced this. We have been 17. Yeah. We've gone to prom. (laughs) It's such motherly advice. Basically, she's saying, honey, don't get your hopes up if things don't go so well. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And yeah, I thought I thought that was great. And that's one of the things I I love about women's letters. Some of these men are writing such flowery, verbose letters that they think you can just tell they think they're so good. And Mm. it's just hard to get through. It's just hard to even read. It's hard to get through. It's painful. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Where this letter is not painful. This letter is short and to the point and it's like, boom, boom, baby. Yeah, it's great. (laughs) And she repeats three times, do not count on this dress getting to you. Literally, I hope this dress gets to you. I hope this handkerchief. I hope this these feathers. But like, don't count on it because like one 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 uh, thing already left and it didn't get on it. So like, I hope and just cross your fingers. You know, like that's the tone for sure. It's like when you're waiting, you know, when you're like, oh crap, I didn't get my Halloween costume. Yes. I better like overnight it from Amazon, and it's just like, oh, I hope it gets here in time. I'm not gonna look fly at the ball without it. <laughs> It's so similar. It's actually uncanny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this it feels it, it definitely feels relatable to me. And I, I had another example. I almost picked this letter, but I uh, I just want to give a quote from an earlier letter from January third, seventeen ninety six. Martha wrote to Noe. I was very sorry, my dear child, to hear that you had been sick and had the toothache. You should be very careful how you go out in the cold to keep your feet dry and to take care of your teeth to clean them every day. <laughs> she just, she keeps going with no real punctuation and everything that she's thinking, like, take care of yourself, take care of yourself, take care of yourself. That is also classic Martha. Oh, yeah. And like, it, I think it's a really good point. It's such a mom move and she's not the mom. She took her adopted grandchildren, her role very seriously. And it gives a little bit of a peek into uh, what she was like as a mother. One of the things I really like about Cassandra Good's book on the Custises mm-hmm. is she gives outsider perspectives on how Martha is with the kids. And she's a little bit smothering. She spoils them a lot. Mm-hmm. From oh, definitely. A third party. Yeah. I mean, her love and like, right, this is like a doting person too. You can imagine the 17 year old. Nellie's 17, right? Not 19. Yeah. She's 17, right? You can imagine 17 year old Nellie being like, ah. Oh, I know, like, (laughs) you know, kind of like, God, you only say it to me like every two seconds. It's this kind of this doting, chittering type of motherly advice because she says, you know, she's all worried that uh, the dress won't get there in time. But also, you better have your cousin help you get dressed. (laughs) I wish you to look as neat as possible. Okay, (laughs) let everything be matching. Let it be all of one piece. (laughs) Oh, oh, also, I love you. I love you. I hope you have a really great time. I have you a great time. Yeah, but let your cousin help you because, like, mm, girl, you need it. That's the vibe, right? <laughs> when she says, I think your dress or I think your chemise will look better with a handkerchief than without. I've sent you one of mine. <laughs> In case you should not have one as your own. And also, you better wear it because it does look better. And I know you might not wear it, so you better wear it. Like, it's just such a mob thing. It's so cute. It's so cute. <laughs> yes. You know, I was trying to think. I don't know if it, like, if, if Martha would be, I don't know if Nellie would be rolling her eyes at this, like, okay, fine, a handkerchief. Or, like, Martha did have a lot of money. She cared a lot about clothes. There's another great letter of her just absolutely tearing into this woman uh, selling lace in Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. She has strong feelings about these things. So I don't know. Maybe maybe it was a very fashionable handkerchief that Nellie was like, yes. <laughs> You're right. She could be like, oh, another handkerchief. But that would only mean that Nellie is very spoiled. <laughs> Grandma, quote unquote, has beautiful handkerchiefs that she gives her all the time. Or maybe she's not rolling her eyes exactly like you said, where it's like, oh, thank God. <laughs> she's <laughs> sending me one of her own. I hope it's one of the good ones. Good ones. Yeah. I, that, I, I don't know. <laughs> a mystery. I don't know either. That's, that's the mystery. <laughs> uh, again, a little bit of the documentary editing side of this letter. This one was a bit of a struggle. A, it was not dated, so it took a lot of research. B, she mentioned several people by name. This is a fairly well-documented time. You can look people up in Philadelphia directories. You can find 
George Washington's thousands of letters. He mentions people all the time. We could not find Mr. Eastern or a really good ID of Mrs. Wright. Uh, we hmm. know that she paid Mrs. Wright for something, but we don't know what service she was providing. <laughs> mm. So mm, it was, I don't know. this was just a little bit of a struggle of a letter for, for a while. When she says a servant of Mr. Eastern's is going, that's probably a slave, but I don't know. That's She's probably, in Philadelphia. Probably, but we don't know for sure. Yes. Yes. It's good to bear in mind that at these balls where Nellie's having fun and meeting people and Martha's sending things, the people who are delivering the clothes, the people who are probably serving them at the ball, the inheritance that people are set up to get, a lot of that includes human beings. And that this was a society where people were human beings. And that's always something that you have to keep in mind, which they did not necessarily have to keep in mind. Like that was something Absolutely. that they would sort of rather that we didn't talk about. And that's why it doesn't turn up in letters all the time. That's right. And or they just, it's a part of their natural life and they take it for granted. Don't even see and it. And so why, why mention the things that are just every day? And also there's a lot of, you mentioned there's a lot of spelling issues in this. This is one of my all-time classic Martha Washington spelling issues. She spells own, O-N-E, that you would read mm -hmm. as one. <laughs> so when she says you should not have one of your own, she spells it O-N-E. But when you think about it, it makes -E, sense. O-N-E, own, it makes sense phonetically. And then the other, the other spelling mistake in this one, which boggles everyone's mind, is she wrote for only, she spelled it O-L-N-Y, only, which is something that is more of a it looks like it's a typing error. That's an error that you yes, make while typing. Is. Every single time we would read this transcription, we would always go back to the manuscript. And even when we sent it on to later editors, we would always go back to the manuscript to make sure that wasn't a typo. And it was not. She spelled it O-L-N-Y. It does not say anything about intelligence. It was a difference in education. And also, I actually like it that you get these absolutely, completely not self-conscious, just writing as she's thinking it, letter yes. that she wrote super yes. fast and sent off, I feel like it is really telling about Martha as a person, and you get to sort of feel for her voice even in the letter. Yes, definitely. And like I was mentioning earlier, just to kind of give an audience, you know, since they can't necessarily like see this letter as they're listening, I'm going to read a sentence, and it's going to have natural pauses in the way that we would think of it today. So, I expect to get your things every moment to put up. A servant of Mr. Eastern's is going to Alexandria. The box will be put under her care for you. Okay. That sounds like natural pauses, but just keep in mind that it looks more like this. I expect to get your things every moment to put up, dash. A servant of Mr. Easterner is going to Alexandria. The box will be put under her care for you, period. You know, it takes you a couple times to be like, oh, oh, that's what the, okay, maybe, maybe it would help modern day readers put a comma there. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not there. And then with letters like this, what I, I it's not just this letter. It's this, these letters of this time period, they would write down things as they were happening or whatever thoughts they wanted, and then they would walk away from it and then add the next day, two days later, a week later, just pick right back up where they left off on that letter and just kept going with something new. And that's not really how we experience letters today, right? The first half of this letter is all about Mr. Easterns is going to Alexandria, this box, I'm trying to get you this stuff, do to do to do, I want you to look nice. And then it just stops and then you just see Wednesday morning. And then it starts again. My dear child. She's like updating her. But there's like at least two days, if not more, represented in this letter. But it's just one letter. I love letters like that. The, the day spanning letters. And again, I say it's like she wrote it really quick. But she, she wrote it really quickly over the span of several days. And then she didn't date it, but she did write Wednesday morning. She at least wrote Wednesday morning to like let even Nellie know, hey, this is like a new new day, new thought. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we have to keep in mind too, you're not you're not writing with an easy peasy ballpoint pen here mm. either. Whatever you take care to even write down, it must matter enough to you. Yeah. Paper is expensive. People always apologizing for the quality of their quills and ink and things like that. A lot of the letters that we come across, almost none of them are just perfectly blank on the back because people would save letters and use them for things like adding up debts and things on the back. Yeah. There's almost always just like family scribbles on them because you just didn't have that much paper back then. No, I mean, think about what you might just jot down quickly on a sticky note. That might be on the what you jot down on like a nice beloved letter from grandma. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh my gosh, my dear beloved grandma. Then it's just like bread, sugar, <laughs> right? Like, or just numbers from some accounting thing, right? Yeah. And we would have to figure out too, because it's like the letters dated this one time, and then there's something written on the back. And we're like, I think that's from like 30 years later. <laughs> 
Nellie does write that she she went to two balls in 1796 and her sister's wedding. She said the balls were very agreeable and I danced a good deal. Dancing, you know, has always been my delight and I prefer balls to any other amusement. Mm, 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 so it seems like they went same, okay. Same, girl. <laughs> same, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it seems, it seems that she really loved dancing. It seems to go okay. I really like that you brought that up because I think this this transitions into something I was thinking about with balls. You know, when we think of balls, we, we don't host balls really today in the same way, but really it's a big dance party and it's a big musical refreshments party. That's what a ball is. And it's one of the fewer moments or there, there were fewer moments during this time period to appropriately interact with the opposite sex. And this is a chaperoned, meaning like, you know, your mom and your aunt and other people are kind of, and other peers are watching. So it's kind of chaperoned. So you want to stay in your lane, but it's your way to physically get close to people, to flirt, especially when so much culture before the mid 19th century in, in general is, is relatively homosocial, where women hang out with women, men hang out with men. Though it's not always true. I mean, you have men and women reading in parlors together and you have men and women dancing. So it's not always the case, but we don't have uh, schools that have men and women really together as much as comes later, right? So this is like a chance to flirt, a chance to be physically close, a chance to socialize, talk in a way where it's safe and you're not breaking any sort of norms or not being coquettish by any <laughs> by any means but you can still kind of get to know other people we still do that today like yeah. come on even <laughs> though we have a much more mixed sex settings in our daily life right socially at work we still like to go to somewhere where there's music and dancing and kind of get to know other people on a different level yeah know? sometimes i think man it'd be so fun to go to old time balls like this and then i think about the fact that she talks about i danced a good deal there were a set number of dances of songs of that you like had to like know the steps to. If somebody didn't want to dance with you, you you weren't dancing. So it really was kind of <laughs> a mark of how well you did of whether you were dancing. People yes. were interested enough in you to keep dancing with you all night. And of course, yes. Nelly was dancing all night. But I know for oh, a yeah. fact that if I was at one of these things, I would not be dancing all night. Ah! Oh my God. Well, I would be your friend pulling you out into the dance floor. So yeah, no, it's so true. And in fact, so it's it's funny. I have I have this book here that I'm using for my own research. It's the Journal and Letters of Philip Vickers Fithian. And he's a plantation tutor of the Old Dominion. So basically, this is 1770. So I know it's like some decades before what we're talking about. But this is like an itinerant tutor journaling, jotting down his experiences um, in Virginia in the 1700s. And there is some great stuff here about balls. Yeah. I just want to say he keeps commenting on how well the girls dance or not, which actually matters apparently, just like you said, right? He's at a ball in Hobbs Hole, which is Tappahannock, Virginia. And he goes, oh, Miss Ritchie danced a minuet. She is a tall, slim girl, dances nimble and graceful. And then there's somebody else where he goes, Mr. Ritchie, he stalked about the room. He was the director of this ball. He danced middling, though. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. And I also want it known that women are not going to bed early, okay? So this guy's writing, and he says, Miss McCall, Miss Ford, Miss Brockenberry, two of the younger Miss Ritchies and Miss Wade, they dance till half after two. Oh. <laughs> then he goes on, my guy friends and I, he goes, quote, we got to bed by three after a day spent in constant violent exercise, <laughs> a.k.a. dancing, okay, and drinking an unusual quantity of liquor. For my part, with fatigue, heat, liquor, noise, want of sleep, and the exertion of my animal spirits, a.k.a. dancing my butt off, I was almost brought to believe several times that I felt a fever fixing upon me. <laughs> I danced and drank and partied so hard, I thought I was getting sick. The next day, he goes, we were called up to breakfast at half after eight. We all looked dull, pale, and haggard. <laughs> like, bro is hung over. And you know those, you know these women are hung over too, right? Are you kidding me? Going to bed at like 2.30 and waking up at like 8.30? Anyways. Oh, I love that. I, that's like a beautiful 18th century language description of a hangover is fantastic. Pale, dull, <laughs> haggard. Have times changed, Katie? Really? <laughs> has our partying changed that much? I don't think our bodily's reaction to too much liquor has. <laughs> I do think of me dancing as animal exertions. <laughs> yes. 
by animal exertions, by violent exercise. That's that's what somebody who would hate me would say about my dancing. <laughs> yeah, her violent exercise. <laughs> Anyways, I know it's not from the Martha letter, but when you when we were reading about balls, I was like, I bet these balls got down. Like I think <laughs> yes. people partied hard into the night. This is not Let's go to bed at eight, ladies. This is our chance to shine. And you weren't barred from balls after you got married. Martha and George actually had a subscription to the Alexandria Balls before he was famous. And they would go and they would go and dance just to be social butterflies in the city. And they would write Wonderful. little critiques of the balls of who, who threw good critique. balls. <laughs> That's right. Who threw the good ones? Who, who did what? Yeah, it's very gossipy. And like, I like that too. Like, let's just point it out there. This is a man's journal I read from, so it's not just women who are gossipy. Anyone who's concerned about social status is going to write like that, and that includes men. You know, lots of men got their social standing from the rich women they married. Mm -hmm. They're concerned with all this stuff, too. Also, I have a slight theory about this letter, and I always read too much into letters, but I have a slight theory about this letter that Martha, she cares so much about Nellie looking nice, looking of a piece, going to this ball, because this is a ball in Virginia. And Martha doesn't want Nellie to marry one of these Philadelphia guys because as soon mm. as she is done with this presidency, Martha wants to go back home to Mount Vernon. So <laughs> she's really hoping, I think, that Nellie makes a good, good impression to the Alexandria and Virginia social scene because Oof. she wants to, to stay down there. That is just a theory that I have. I think your theory, I'd, I'd buy into it, you know, especially since you said earlier tonight that. Nellie wishes she were in Philadelphia by the tone of her letters. That would not that would not miss Martha. Martha would know that. Yeah. Right. So she's like, you go, you go look nice, you go have fun at this Alexandria ball, and you meet a nice man, and like, oh, everything will be fine. <laughs> right. You'll be close to me and all these Philadelphia things, you'll just they'll just go away, right? Like, of course, you know, we're not seeing that in the literal writing, but like, I don't know. It's fun to infer, especially when you have context clues. Yes. That's just a just a little guess that I have, but Nellie does, of course, she marries one of George Washington's nephews and lives basically at Mount Vernon next door. So it works. So out. Martha, Martha got what she wanted. I hope Nellie did too. <laughs> <laughs> and then the very last thing that I just thought was funny where she says, I'm so sorry for the feathers. <laughs> <They're>, <laughs> I'm sorry I'm sending you these ugly feathers in this box. They were the only <sighs> ones that were there. They're the only feathers. All the good ones were taken. Like, just do what you can, man. Like, that's like the tone of it. Definitely. It's really funny. With a beautiful, a beautiful chemise, a beautiful handkerchief, and these ugly feathers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Martha's so concerned. She's like, oh, God, I hope this husband won't care about this feathers, like this future husband. It's like, it's fine, Martha. It's like, you almost like, you almost want to just like reading it now. How many years later? It's just like, oh, Martha, you're so loving. But also, like, it's fine. <laughs> She's yeah. going to look fine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's funny. This is not the most intense letter. This is very much a little slice of life, a little moment. But those are some of the ones that I, I enjoy digging into. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast and talking about this with me. Oh, you're welcome. It was absolutely my pleasure. And it's often from these slice of life letters that you get at people's real emotions, real life, and real concerns that you're just like not necessarily going to get from a letter that's kind of more high-minded or political, right? Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. This was wonderful. For my listeners, I will leave more information about the letters we've been quoting in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening. And I am, as ever, your most obedient and humble servant. Thank you very much. Your Most Obedient and Humble Servant is a production of R2 Studios at the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media at George Mason University. I'm Katherine Garrett, the creator and host of this podcast. Jeanette Patrick and Jim M. Buskey are the executive producers. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to listen to past episodes and check out more great podcasts from R2 Studios. We tell unexpected stories based on the latest research to connect listeners with the past. So head to r2studios.org to start listening. <laughs>